So we're going to continue talking about linear algebra a bit, and then we are going to um, to apply this to differential equations. So on Tuesday, we defined matrix vector multiplication. And when you see the definition, it doesn't look all of that intuitive, at least I don't think so. But the definition comes from um, linear algebra and for wanting to work with systems of linear equations. And a system of linear equations is something like this. We've got however many variables we have, let's say we have three variables, then this is a linear equation of three variables. I mean, if you, if you scribble with that out, this would be college algebra, the general form of a linear equation. So we just, uh, we go from two variables to three in a pretty natural way. And we can have multiple equations and we can have as many or few equations as we like. Normally, at least for this class, we'll have as many equations as we have variables. So if we have three variables, we're going to be looking at three so many subscripts here, let me quickly fix a typo. If we have three variables, we're probably looking at three equations. And this might be obvious, but again, just under the assumption that maybe you've never taken any sort of linear algebra, um, this curly bracket notation is saying that we're looking at these three equations at once, that they're a system. And what that means is that if you have a value x1, x2, x3, that list is a solution if and only if it's a solution to all the equations. And one of the first things we do in linear algebra is learn to solve systems of linear equations. I don't know if we're actually going to do that in this class, or if we are, we're just going to learn it as a black box calculator algorithm. We certainly won't learn the details. But at the moment, solving this isn't what I want to talk about. What I want to talk about at the moment is the fact that systems can be rewritten as vector 
equations and as matrix equations. So maybe you have, let's use X, Y, and Z, just because I get sick of writing subscripts. Maybe we have a system of equations. Like this. This can be rewritten as in terms of vectors. If you are uh, our little color bar went away. Um, okay, I can fix this. If I stop the screen share and then bring the whiteboard back, we'll come back. So if we take, you can imagine having a one there and a one there. If we take the coefficients in front of the X and turn them into a vector, and we take the coefficients in front of the y and turn them into a vector and take the coefficients. Again, if we don't have a coefficient, we can imagine we have a one and take the coefficients in front of the z and turn them into a vector, then this system of linear equations can be rewritten as a single vector equation. <laughs> so an unknown times a vector plus a second unknown times a different vector Thus, a third unknown times a different vector equals a fourth known vector. Well, this can also be written as a matrix vector product. And this is why, even though, even though that definition of um, of matrix vector multiplication maybe doesn't seem so intuitive at first blush, we uh, like it. We want to use it. It's because it lets us rewrite the system of linear equations as a matrix times an unknown vector equals a known vector. And in particular, if we just take all of the coefficients in this system, I mean, you see that if we ignore the x's and y's and z's, we have three, a three by three grid of numbers. So this basically is a matrix. And if we take these coefficients and we dump them into a matrix, that system of linear equations can be rewritten as a matrix times a vector. 
<laughs> and again, if this were linear algebra and like the first or second day of linear algebra, <laughs> I'd be like, okay, we should learn how to find the X and the Y and the Z that satisfy this. That's not, um, <laughs> That's not a priority at the <laughs> at the moment. I think that the <laughs> office you wouldn't think it. It's getting better because <laughs> it's because I walk to work every day in the cold. <laughs> that every time I'm teaching this class, it's at its worst. Anyway, <laughs> geez. Okay, so um. The reason we're interested in this is that we're really in differential equations, we're really interested in systems. So we're really interested in looking at multiple differential equations at once. And let me, we'll actually study this towards the end of the course, but just to try to justify that thing, let's look. <laughs> at a pretty famous system of differential equations. And my hopping makes this uh, a very topical system of differential equations. We'll look at a model for disease. Oh, this is going to sound nasty in the recording. But the SIR model for disease is, is a rudimentary but very famous disease model. And it's what we call a compartmental model. And it works like this. Suppose that a disease breaks out, then everybody in the affected region can be classed into one of three um, categories. People can be susceptible to the disease, might be misspelling that, but they haven't gotten sick and they can get sick. Or people can be, let's say, infective. They are sick with the disease and they can spread the disease to other people. I am not infective. If you were worrying about the cough, it's just irritating. Or people can be, let's say, recover. People got the disease and then they got better. And not all diseases do this. I mean, COVID doesn't do it to give an uh, obvious sort of topical example, but a lot of diseases grant immunity on recovery. Like you get it as a child and then you don't get it again. So we're going to assume that people can move between these categories as follows. People who are susceptible can become infective. People who are infective can become recovered. People who are recovered stay recovered. And let me see if I'm trying to, if I uh, try to reproduce this model by memory. But we can think of the number of people in the susceptible category and the number of people who are infective and the number of people who are recovered as variables. And these variables are changing over time. 
And we can therefore ask, well, how's the S variable changing over time? How's the R variable changing over time? No, let's get this in the proper order. It's SIR. So we'll ask how the I variable is changing over time next. And then we can ask how the R variable is changing over time. And let's see, the SDT, the number of susceptible people in this model is strictly going down because people can become sick. And once they're sick, they're not, I mean, we're assuming that the population is basically constant here. So we're not imagining that like hordes of susceptible people are coming in via immigration or anything. We're just looking at this model and in this model, people can leave us and they can't re-enter us. So negative will have an infection rate and then we'll have SI here. S times I. And the reason we have S times I, this is sort of similar to the, the logistic animal birth model, where instead of births, we're looking at new instances of a disease. Um, for this disease to be spread, and a susceptible person and an infective person have to make contact. And there are S times I ways that a susceptible and an infective person can make contact. So how is the infective population changing over time? Well, the people who are leaving the susceptible category are entering the susceptible the infective category. So that same term that appears in the first equation appears in the second equation as well. People are also leaving the infective category and people are leaving the infective category at a rate of B times I. And I'm trying to make sense of that. Well, B is a recovery rate and it's B times I because the more people who are currently sick, the more people are recovering from the illness. You know, if only one person is sick, then only one person can recover. But if a million people are sick, then a hundred thousand people could recover. And then this DRDT, sort of the opposite of DSDT, because it's always increasing. People who leave the infective category enter the recover category. So this is a system of differential equations. We have, we have three differential equations. And if you're clever, you could bring that number down to two. You could say, okay, we're assuming the population is basically constant. So the number of susceptible people plus the number of infective people plus the number of recovered people is constant. That means that the number of recovered people can be solved for in terms of these other equations. 
and performing just a little calculus. The R dt equals negative ds dt minus di dt. So if we could find ds and di, we'd have dr as well. So we don't really need a dr equation. So you could get it down to this. And notice in relation to what I said earlier, that we normally have as many um, equations as we have variables. That is true here. We have the S and the I variable, two variables, two equations. Now, these differential equations can't be looked at in isolation because they interact with one another. We can't just say, okay, ignore I for now, and let's just look at S, because S has the I variable in it. Similarly, we can't just say, ignore S for now, and we'll just look at I, right? because I has the S variable in it. So if we're going to look at this system, at this model, we have to view S and I as a system, and we have to try to study these two differential equations simultaneously. And doing this by hand is normally a pretty hopeless endeavor. I mean, we haven't even, we, we don't know how to solve most single differential equations, right? So, I mean, if we're going to make it even more complicated, well, we're making it even more complicated, but, um, but we're going to learn tools for studying systems of differential equations um, without necessarily solving them. We'll look briefly at numerical tools, and then we'll spend a lot of time doing fixed point analysis. Because fixed point analysis, I mean, is often really sort of what you're interested in. You've got this epidemic, What's going to happen? Is everybody in the country going to get sick and then recover? Or is the disease going to fizzle out? Or is there going to be kind of a permanent reservoir where like one one thousandth of the country is always sick at any given time, and the rest are either in S or in R. Those are really questions about fixed points. Like looking at this model, I mean, the model where Note the, the values, I should say, where nobody is susceptible and nobody is infective, everybody is recovered. This is a fixed point. So we can ask, well, is this an asymptotically stable fixed point? Is it something we can realistically see in the real world? In order to do fixed point analysis, though, we're going to need some pretty substantial tools. So, we're going to, let's call this a sub goal. Solve. C 
systems of linear homogeneous differential equations. And I mean, when we actually do this, just like we did in the, in the one dimensional case, We're going to need these things to have constant coefficients. And again, this is a super specific type of system. It's not a system you would really expect to see in the real world. Like, this is not linear, just to get that out of the way. Um, it's not linear because our um, variables are being multiplied together. So it's not that we expect to see this a lot in the real world. Rather, we're going to use this as a tool for studying more realistic systems down the line. And to make sure we're on the same page, I mean, I haven't put on the board a formal definition, a system of linear differential equations would look like this. Our variables are going to be x1, x2, up to xn. Um, when we have systems, we're normally going to use the prime notation for compactness. X1 prime equals something times X1 plus something times X2 plus we're going to have as many equations as we have variables. Let's say we have n variables and n equations. And then in the non-homogeneous case, we can have some very some function of t. And it's a bad habit of um well, of textbooks, but I guess I've inherited it, not to use function notation even when we have functions. So I'm not writing this notation on the board, but these P's are allowed to be functions in the definition at least. Um, but they're functions of T. They're not functions of any of the X variables. And then this pattern just repeats. X2 prime is something times X1 plus something times X2. Uh, and again, once I start getting these uh, little subscripts on the board, I need to be very careful or errors will creep in. And then this pattern repeats up down to our nth variable. So, 
sorry, I really kind of a cramp. I need to step in and we're back. So we've got, if we have like, the system of differential equations, these are all linear differential equations according to the definition. Um, see, my screen sharing is paused. There, that screen. We are recording. I don't know why Zoom is being like this. Did your Zoom share down there on your bottom? Ah, there we are. So, um, sort of just like just like the first dimensional case where we, you know, introduce these in generality and then basically instantly said, okay, we're only going to look at homogeneous equations. Um, and now my, my pen is missing. We are basically only going to look, Zoom, you're killing me here. We are basically only going to look at the homogeneous case and the homogeneous case is when these Fs are all the zero function. So let me get that down on the whiteboard. If these are all zero, if these all just um, aren't there, then the system, is called homogeneous. Now, because this is a system of linear differential equations, or rather, I mean, yes, but because this is a system of linear equations, it can be rewritten in terms of matrices, albeit the entries of the matrices will be functions instead of just constants. Some in particular, this is X1 prime, X2 prime, Xn prime, equals the matrix that has these functions as its entries. Times X one, X two, up to XN plus F one, F two, up to F. And so this is a pretty, I mean, even just watching it, you might be thinking that this gets pretty tedious to write every time. But I mean, using vector notation, this is a vector of X's. This is a matrix of P's. This is a vector of X. And this can be rewritten very compactly as X prime equals P times X plus F. So, 
So a few things about, about that expression. I mean, maybe this is so intuitive that it doesn't need to be explicitly commented on, but if you have a matrix or a vector of functions, you can take the derivative of that matrix or vector in, in the perfectly natural way. Just take the derivative of the elements of the matrix or the vector. So back on this frame, you, you see that we have the derivative of the vector. It's defined in the natural way. Um, out to this with um, matrices and vectors works about how you'd expect it would at least up to a point. Um, in particular, if we've got the derivative of a sum, it's the sum of the derivatives. If we've got the derivative of a scalar multiplication, the scalar pulls out. We can't ask whether stuff like the product rule generalizes because we have not defined multiplication between two matrices. I mean, outside of the very special case where one of the matrices is a vector. I mean, this is suddenly turned very thin. Let me fix that. So we have, or we're looking at things like this. And this is written as a single equation, but really it's a bunch of equations. It's a system of linear differential equations written very completely. And in the case we're going to actually look at for most of this semester, we're going to mostly look at homogeneous systems, and in the homogeneous case, that F is zero, and it goes away. So here, I mean, this vector X is unknown. This vector X is what we're trying to solve. Let's see, we should generalize a few definitions. They generalize in a pretty natural way. Um, if a single linear differential equation is going to have multiple independent solutions. And I mean, we can talk about dependence and independence, then there's no reason a system should not also have that property. And we're going to be working in basically the same framework if we have n systems with n variables, we're going to want n 
Veneurvi independent solutions. And the definition of linear the independent is going to generalize very naturally. So a solution here is going to be a vector of functions. And the definition of linear independence is going to be the exact same definition we saw earlier on, except that now we have got vectors. They're linearly independent. If this linear combination has only the trivial solution. And again, by trivial solution, I mean that the only way this is true is if all of these C's are equal to zero. So if there's any non-trivial solution, that means they're dependent. If there's no non-trivial solution, that means they're independent. Any questions so far? Then Let's see, between introducing differential equation stuff and introducing linear algebra stuff, this, this section is really kind of a grab bag. Um, when? are vectors dependent or independent. So more out of tradition than anything else, I think, we're going to generalize the Ronskian. It's not something we're going to use a huge amount in this class, but it's very, uh, very sort of traditional material. And we're going to start, I mean, the Ronskian tells us when solutions of differential equations are dependent and independent. Let's uh, step back from that and ask an easier question, or at least a seemingly easier question. When are numerical vectors dependent or independent? Like if we have one, two, seven, three, four, nine, Zero, zero, one. Are these vectors dependent or independent? Well, there are, I mean, there are, in practice, there are better ways to answer this question than the one I'm going to present to you. We talk about this in linear algebra, but one way you could approach this question is to take these vectors, turn them into a matrix. 
So I mentioned when I was talking about matrix vector multiplication that a lot of times matrices are basically vector storage units. So I'm taking these vectors and I'm making them columns of a matrix. And we can look at something called the determinant of the matrix. And the determinant is a number. And for our purposes, the only thing that matters about the determinant is that if the determinant is zero, the columns of the matrix are dependent. And if it's non zero, the columns of the matrix are independent. And tradition or no tradition, I don't want to dwell on um, the determinant because it's, it's kind of appalling. But um, the determinant is defined and now I'm completely blanking on the word I want. We define the determinant of two by two matrices, then we use that definition to define the determinant of three by three matrices, then we use recursive. Then we use that definition to define the determinant of four by four matrices and so on. And if you want to talk about the determinant of a matrix, the notation, or at least one of several pieces of notation is to replace the parentheses or the square brackets with the vertical lines. And the determinant of a two by two matrix is easy. You multiply the numbers on the diagonal and you multiply the numbers on the anti-diagonal and then you subtract them. Four minus six is negative two. And that tells you that this vector and this vector are independent because the determinant is not to zero. Again, in linear algebra, we could say a bit more than that, like, okay, but what's it mean for it to be negative two specifically? Um, but you know, this isn't a linear algebra course. We're just presenting the material as it's relevant to us. And as it's relevant to us, it's either zero or it isn't. And anything else is irrelevant. The instant you get the three by three, things turn into much more of a headache. Although three by three isn't the worst, and I'm going to make our life easy by having a few zeros floating around. 
So to find the determinant of a three by three matrix, we're going to select a row or we're going to select a column. From a pure the mathematical point of view, it does not matter which row or column you select. From an effort point of view, if there are any zeros in the matrix, that's a blessing. And you want to select the row or the column that contains as many zeros as possible. But maybe, maybe just to illustrate something, I'll select something else. Maybe I'll select the second row. That still has a zero in it. Now, we have a three by three matrix. We're going to construct as much of a three by three sign chart as we need. So we're going to put positive and negative signs in here. And the upper left entry is always going to be positive, and then it's going to alternate. Positive, negative, positive, negative. And we only care about the row or the column we selected. So positive, negative, positive, negative. And this is the only part of the sign chart that we're going to care about. Now we're going to take this row and this row of the sign chart and we're going to sort of put them together. Negative zero is going to be multiplied by something. Plus one, which is going to be multiplied by something. Minus three, which is going to be multiplied by something. And you see that we're putting these together using addition and subtraction. And these signs here are telling us which we use for which entries. Negative zero, positive one, negative three. Now. Try that again. Let's erase that because we're done with it. So the reason that it's nice to have zeros, I mean, it's just on a purely practical level, zero times anything is zero. So negative zero times whatever might as well not be there, and we don't have to worry about it. What about this one? So this one comes from this entry. And what we're going to do is we're going to, if I were working on a piece of paper, I just cover this up, but this whiteboard makes it easy. We can scribble out the row and the column that contains this one. And you see that we have four numbers left arranged in a grid. So we basically have a two by two matrix here. One, four, six, one. And let me give myself some room to work with. Um, the thing we're going to multiply one by is the determinant 
of this two by two matrix. And now we've got three times something. We're subtracting because of the sign chart. And we're going to repeat that. The three is there. And if we scribble out the column and we scribble out the row that the three is occupying, we get basically a two by two matrix. And we take the determinant of that two by two matrix. And then, well, what are these determinants? Let me erase that so we can see the matrix we're working with. Um, well, for two by two matrices, you multiply the diagonals and the anti-diagonals and you subtract them. One times one minus 24 minus three times zero minus 12. So um, just off the top of my head, negative, 23, let's see, negative three and negative 12 should be plus 36. So 13, I make that. And 13 is not to zero, so what this is telling us is that the vectors that make up this matrix are linearly independent. <laughs> um, this pattern repeats for bigger matrices, but becomes unfeasible to do almost instantly. I mean, I'm not going to do this, but if you imagine a larger matrix and maybe I mean, maybe all of the entries are nice integers, but, but there aren't any zeros. I mean, there's no way you can do this. That's not going to end up, it's not going to end in tiers. I mean, there are no zeros. You select a, um, you select a row or column, pretty much at random. And then it's, well, it's one times something minus one times something plus two times something minus three times something. And I mean, just looking at the one, this something is a determinant you scribble out the column and you scribble out the row. So we need the determinant of of a three by three matrix. And that's, you know, all of the work on this frame, except it's more work because there aren't any zeros. So you have to compute three two by two determinants. 
I mean, in practice, if you need the determinant of a large matrix, even a computer is not going to be able to find it like this. A computer is going to, to have to um, numerically estimate the, the determinant. I mean, I think I like, if you perform like five, Flops, additions, multiplications, um, subtractions, uh, divisions. If you perform, if you were like trying to work by hand and you did like five flops a second, it would be well over a year to find the determinant of a twelve by twelve matrix. Um, which, by the way, um having to use numerical software to estimate it causes all sorts of problems. Because if you get a determinant like 0 0.00013, well, the, the columns of the matrix are either independent or not, depending on whether that's actually zero or whether or not and you just have some rounding error or whether or not it's actually that number. So it's all kind of a mess. But, um, but the determinant can be used to generalize the Ronskian. That's all we are really interested in it for. So say that you have solutions now, x1, x2, let me use function notation to emphasize that these vectors are vectors of functions. And Let's explicitly consider the case that matters to us where these are solutions to a linear homogeneous differential equation. We, uh, we don't strictly need the homogeneous here, I think, but if we're talking about using the superposition principle to create general solutions, and I mean, that's the situation where we care about independence. So we might as well assume that this uh, that we've got the homogeneous case here. But anyway, if we have these solutions and we want to know whether they're dependent or independent, then at least theoretically, the stuff we did with the determinant generalizes perfectly. We create a matrix that has these solutions as its column. And we find the determinant of this matrix. And the determinant of this matrix has, has a special name, it's called the Ronskian. We've already uh, seen that word, albeit briefly. The Ronskian is a function. So your first instinct might be that that's, I mean, the stuff we talked about with the determinant 
you know, zero or non-zero, it might seem like that's not going to really work because a function, I mean, sometimes it might be zero and sometimes it might not be zero. But in fact, in this case, where these functions we're looking at are solutions to a homogeneous differential equation. The Runskian is either never zero or it's the zero function. It's always zero. And those are the only options. And if it's zero, these solutions are dependent. And if it's not zero, they're independent. And I guess it's 1040, that brings us about to the end of the class. So be uh, careful on the sidewalks out there. And now.